Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Mitrice Richardson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, a look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the disappearance and death, then move to my analysis. Mitrice Richardson was born on April 30, 1985. She grew up in Covina, California, where she lived with her mother and stepfather. She was interested in dancing and was a cheerleader. Richardson attended California State University Fullerton after graduating from high school in West Covina. She earned a bachelor's degree in psychology in 2008. Richardson moved to Los Angeles to live with her grandmother because she planned on teaching in that area. Richardson had a few different jobs. She worked as a clerk at a shipping company and part-time as a dancer in an LGBT strip club. She entered beauty pageants and was interested in becoming a model. Richardson had a girlfriend for about two years named Tessa Moon. The couple broke up in the spring of 2009. After the breakup, Richardson became obsessed with a woman named Vanessa. Vanessa already had a girlfriend, but Richardson was not worried about that. After driving to Los Angeles to intrude on Vanessa's birthday party, Vanessa told Richardson to stay away from her. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance and death. On September 16, 2009, Richardson drove to Jeffrey's Restaurant on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, California. Richardson was waiting for the valet. When he was ready, he found Richardson in his vehicle, which was nearby with the door open. She was looking at his CDs. He asked Richardson why she was there. She responded, it's subliminal, before saying something about avenging the death of Michael Jackson. Richardson gave the valet her keys and mentioned Vanessa's name, asking if Vanessa was in the restaurant. The valet didn't recognize the name. She then told him to keep an eye out for a girl with tattoos on her arms. The valet warned the hostess that Richardson seemed pretty weird. In the restaurant at her table, Richardson ordered steak and a cocktail. She seemed to be interested in a party of seven at a nearby table. She left her table and sat down with this group. She was attempting to join the conversation. She talked about astrological signs. One of the guests said that Richardson's behavior was bizarre, but manageable when a staff member approached to make sure everything was okay. Richardson returned to her own table, only to come back and talk to that party some more. She then told them she was traveling to Hawaii and would get in touch with them when she arrived. So she really must have thought they made a connection in that short time. After the party of seven left the restaurant, Richardson walked toward the exit. The manager intercepted her and inquired as to how she was going to pay for her meal. The bill was $89. Richardson explained that the party of seven should have paid the bill for her, but the manager wasn't buying that story. Richardson then said, I am busted. What are we going to do? She appeared to be in some type of trance. She told the manager that she could pay the bill with sex, explained how she was from Mars, and emptied her pockets in order to show that she didn't have any money. The police were called to the restaurant. As everyone was waiting for the police to arrive, Richardson talked about how God had instructed her to take the afternoon off as she was watching a soap opera at work. She mentioned she had a great-grandmother named Mildred. The hostess called Mildred in an effort to settle the bill like to avoid having Richardson arrested. Mildred offered her credit card number to cover the bill, but the restaurant refused the offer because they required a signature. At about 9 p.m., the police arrived. They found a marijuana joint on Richardson. After searching her 1998 Honda Civic, they found a partially consumed bottle of alcohol and remnants of marijuana. Based on the results of a field sobriety test, the police believed that Richardson was not under the influence of substances. Staff at the restaurant was willing to pay Richardson's bill because then she could walk free with just a ticket for possessing marijuana. So it's really clear in this narrative, I think, that these people at the restaurant really wanted to help Richardson out. They didn't think that going to jail for an $89 bill made a lot of sense. So at every point, they were really trying to find a way to assist her in avoiding a more serious charge. Ultimately, they decided not to pay the bill because they did not want Richardson driving a vehicle. The manager pressed charges. 
So here we see, even though they wanted to help her, there was this sense that she was perhaps a danger to herself. There was a feeling of relief when the police came to get Richardson, the sense that, okay, now she would be safe. The police were here, and they would go through the appropriate steps to make sure that Richardson did not harm herself. Richardson was arrested for defrauding an innkeeper and for possession of marijuana. Her purse, phone, and money were locked in her car, and the car was towed away. The police denied seeing those items in the vehicle at the time of Richardson's arrest. They may have been left there for by Richardson. Either way, the items would be found later. Richardson was transported to a police station in Calabasas, California, and placed in jail. The arresting officer failed to mention her bizarre behavior in the arrest report. The only number Richardson had memorized was that of Mildred, her great-grandmother. She tried to call Mildred four times. Mildred would later say that her phone did not ring, but the police said they heard Richardson talking. Now, it could have been that she was talking to herself, so that doesn't prove that she was actually on the phone with Mildred. Maitrese Richardson's mother called the police station and expressed concern regarding her daughter's mental health status. Her mother noted that Richardson's behavior was out of the ordinary. She had never been arrested before. Her mother was also concerned that Richardson was not familiar with the area. The police then told her that Richardson would not be released until later that morning. She was safe. There was nothing to worry about. The next day, September 17, Richardson was released at 12.15 a.m. She did not have access to a vehicle and therefore could not get to her purse, money, or phone. She had no way to call for assistance. The police station was not served by buses at night. The closest businesses that were open were about a mile away. The police told her that she could wait in the lobby, but she turned down the offer. Richardson's mother called the police station at 5.35 a.m. They told her that Richardson had already been released. At 6.30 a.m., the police received a call from a man named Bill Smith, who lived in Montanito, California. He described a woman matching Richardson's appearance walking through his backyard. Smith opened his window and asked if the woman was okay. She said, I'm just resting. After this, she disappeared, and Bill did not know which direction she was traveling. After the police arrived, they found tracks from sneakers, but quickly lost the trail. Richardson was reported missing not long after this. Many people believe that Richardson was somewhere in Dark Canyon. Not only was this the last place she was seen, but local residents heard screaming several nights after she disappeared. The canyon was searched extensively by law enforcement and volunteers in January of 2010, but no sign of Richardson was discovered at that time. In August of 2010, rangers were in Dark Canyon. They were about eight miles from the police station in Malibu, where Richardson was released from. The rangers were inspecting a marijuana farm that had been run by a Mexican cartel. The word inspecting makes it sound like the rangers were just trying to make sure the farm was up to code. In reality, they were trying to make sure that the farm, which had been destroyed before, had not been replanted. As the rangers were walking through a clearing, they noticed a skull and a naked body. They had found the remains of Maitrese Richardson. The detectives investigating her death removed her body, even though the coroner had told them not to. The police determined that she had not been murdered. The parents filed a lawsuit against the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. The case would settle sometime later. A criminal investigation was opened in January of 2016, so it appears as though they wanted to see if the death was in fact a homicide. But in December of 2016, the California Attorney General's Office decided there was insufficient evidence to warrant a criminal investigation. Now moving to my analysis. It is believed that Maitrese Richardson was exhibiting symptoms of bipolar disorder at the time when she disappeared. Not long after Vanessa rejected Richardson, a number of unusual behaviors were observed. Richardson did not talk too much on the phone with other people. She posted strange messages on social media. She talked to somebody about seeking mental health counseling. In the days leading up to her disappearance, she sent her mother a number of bizarre text messages. She talked about how she wanted to speak to Michelle Obama so she could get a job in the White House. On the day she was arrested, her co-workers at the shipping company noticed that she was in an unusually good mood. She worked for a little while, left for lunch, and never came back. She stopped at Mildred's house briefly and then did something unusual at the residence of her aunt. 
she took her business cards and plastered them all over the porch and on a vehicle. They contained mostly random thoughts. When considering the evidence, is it possible or likely that Richardson had bipolar disorder? The disorder is characterized by depressive and manic episodes. Sometimes when a person with a disorder has a major mood episode, they become psychotic. There is no way to know if Richardson had the disorder or not, but her behavior was certainly consistent with mania and psychosis. The mania would explain her sudden elevated mood, high level of energy, goal-directed behavior, and erratic decision-making. The psychosis could explain her belief that she was going to get invited to the White House, and she was a resident of the planet Mars. Moving to the next question, what about the behavior of the police? Were they at fault in this case? The police initially said that Richardson was released from jail because she has no signs of mental illness or intoxication. They said she was fine. She was an adult. The police would make additional statements about her mental status to justify that behavior. They said Richardson was obviously well-educated and intelligent. There was nothing to justify keeping her overnight. She appeared to be entirely aware of her surroundings and did not seem confused. She exhibited no signs whatsoever of mental incapacitation. Richardson had been recorded in her jail cell by the police. By the time the video was finally made available to her family, it appeared as though certain segments had been cut out. The police refused to provide an unedited version of the recording. I think the police are in a challenging position because they don't have any substantive training in mental health, yet they're put in a position where they have to try to keep people with mental disorders safe, as well as keeping the public safe. Richardson was likely under the influence of substances and suffering from mental health symptoms. The police should have initiated the process for a mental health evaluation. I think this case exemplifies the concern about limited mental health training for police officers. As I've talked about before in other videos, I feel as though the police are asked to perform too many divergent and seemingly unrelated tasks. They can't be good at everything. They're expected to drive well, to be proficient with firearms, to have good critical thinking skills, and understand mental health. Perhaps law enforcement agencies need a few key people trained in mental health who respond specifically to potential mental health-related situations. Now moving to the next question, how did Maitrese Richardson die? Was it homicide? The cause of Richardson's death is unknown. As I mentioned, the police said it was not homicide. Some of the theories would include anaphylactic shock, poison oak, or a rattlesnake bite. Her clothing was found in an unusual state. Her clothes were not torn off. Her belt had been unbuckled, her jeans unzipped, and her bra unhooked. It could have been that she removed her clothing before dying. The police said that Richardson's clothing was removed by animals or rushing water. I find it a little odd that the police would believe that animals would unzip zippers and unbuckle belt buckles. But then again, this is California, so perhaps the animals there are a little bit more into fashion. I'm really not sure what the police were thinking. Similarly, water would not unfasten items of apparel either. So they were really kind of ascribing some unusual characteristics to both animals and rushing water. So this seems to be a bit of a stretch. I think it makes much more sense that she removed her clothes or some type of assailant did. Her death was not properly investigated, so there's no way to know what happened. She was certainly in a vulnerable state and could have been murdered, but I think it's more likely she died through some type of accident or she brought an end to her own life. What lessons can we learn in this case? I think this case really highlights the tough situation the police are put in, as I mentioned before, and how citizens tend to trust the police and sometimes the results don't work out well. Like here, we see all those people in the restaurant who really wanted to help Maitrese Richardson. They really did think it was absurd that she would have to be punished so severely when she clearly appeared to be having trouble understanding reality. They knew something was wrong. I imagine they didn't have mental health training either, but they could see that some type of intervention was necessary. They called the police, believing the police were the ones who could help Richardson. Even though the police could see the same behavior, that the people in the restaurant saw, we see a completely different reaction. The police were really just interested in charging her and letting her go. They really didn't want to get involved with helping her in any way.
more training in mental health, compassion, and a little bit of common sense probably would have protected Richardson from her ultimate fate. This was a completely preventable death of somebody who's having fairly pronounced mental health symptoms. It's disheartening that her symptoms could be recognized by the people at the restaurant, but ignored by law enforcement. Those are my thoughts on the case of Maitrese Richardson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.